Scripture, there's multiple judgments and types of judgment that people confuse. And if you confuse them, then you are uh, maybe taking judgment in one place that means one thing and applying it somewhere else where you should be using the other definition. So let's just run through them very quickly, the four judgments. At least four, four judgments. First judgment, Romans 3, verse 4, quoting out of the New King James Version. Let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. Who's being judged according to Paul here? God. First judgment is our judgment and the universe's judgment of God. Because Satan lied about God. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father and I are one. We must do exactly what Elijah called the people to do at Carmel. If the Lord is like Yahweh, worship him. If he is like Baal, worship him. What was he calling the people to do? Make a a choice based on a judgment, right? They had to judge. Is, who, is, who is God like? First judgment. And this is the judgment, I will tell you, that is, in my view, primarily, but, but maybe this passage has a dual meaning, but it's the primary meaning of the first angel's message. Fear God and give glory to him. Be in awe of him. Reveal him in your character because the, because the hour of his judgment has come. Not the hour of his judicial magistrate, the hour of his judgment, the hour that we are finally going to worship him who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all living, judge him to be creator and whose laws are design laws, and stop worshiping the dark ages imperial dictator who's the source of pain and suffering. That's the first judgment. God is calling at the end of time for the people to make a right judgment and worship the creator. That's it. Second judgment, Malachi 3, 1 through 5. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, and says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire and a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the... Levites and refine them like silver and gold. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness and offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by, as in former years. So I will come near to you for judgment. This is a judgment that happens when the Lord comes to his temple to cleanse the temple. This is the judgment that we read about when he comes to the people in judgment. This actually has multiple nuanced meaning, but it all has the same focus. It's about cleansing people from sin. That's what this judgment is. He comes to cleanse the people, to purge the dross from the silver and the gold, which is us. That's what he comes for through history. This is this judgment. Okay, it has a culmination, but it's a process. And so when you read about God's judgments in Old Testament times, this is, this is part of it. He comes to judgment. And what is the judgment? It is the diagnosis of what is wrong and then the judgment of the action needed to cleanse, to heal, to offer remedy. And these are the judgments of the flood, of Sodom and Gomorrah, of all the actions through the Old Testament. It's also Jesus' work in the heavenly sanctuary when he comes to examine the records and what are recorded in the records? Reality. Names, 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 you read the scripture over and over again, name recorded in the record, name recorded in the record, multiple places through scripture you'll find name recorded in the record and what in the Bible is a name representative of? Character. character. Your character, your individuality is recorded there and so he comes to cleanse the characters of his people, preparing us to stand in his presence before the second coming. And that requires judgment of two types. One, he judges who individually has trusted him and opened their heart. Ah, you have let me in. I judge, you've given me permission to fix the damage. Oh, I judge that you have shut your heart to me. You won't let me in. You've denied me. So the first is judging, concluding, evaluating, assessing, diagnosing who will let him work in their hearts and who won't. 
And then the second is examining the character and identifying any residual elements that we freely want him to remove but maybe haven't been fully removed. Thief on the cross gave his heart to the Lord and died shortly thereafter. How much maturing of character did he experience in his life? But in this judgment, Christ goes to his record, his individuality, his character, stored in a digital database of some sort, and examines, yes, I have been given authority and authorization to operate and work in this individual. First judgment of that aspect. And as I examine, yes, he's given me a brain. He wants all the defects removed. And I examine the lines of code. And I remove everything out of harmony with my design. I write my law, my perfect character of love, into this individual who's given me permission. Thus, when he rises, he doesn't rise a thief in rebellion who's, selfishness, who's selfish and afraid of God who wants to steal. He rises somebody who loves God and others more than self and is loyal and faithful and trustworthy. This is the second judgment. The third judgment, Revelation 20, 4 through 6. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast in his image and had not received the mark on the forehead and their hand. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And you also see 1 Corinthians 6, 3. Do you not know that we will judge angels? Third judgment, during the thousand years, the saints review the history of what has transpired in the lives of the lost and the angels that are fallen and judge God's actions as to why some have been saved and why these have not and confirm through examination of evidence that every lost individual is lost by their persistent refusal to stay away and reject all the healing God has offered. Third judgment. Fourth judgment. Revelation 20, 11 and 12. I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And books were opened. Another book was opened, which was the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done recorded in the books. And what book was this? The book of life. Some people's names are retained and some are erased out of this book. And if you read again, what is written in this book? The names. There's multiple Bible passages. The names written in the book of life. Name written in the book of life. Name written in the book of life. What's the name? Character. Character. That's exactly right. And what determines... Your character. Choices. And the, yes, choices. And the prime, first, number one choice, who you trust. Have you surrendered your individual self, your heart, your soul to Jesus in trust? Open yourself. That's the first and most important choice. After that, there may be battles with individual temptations that we struggle with, but if we remain surrendered in trust, it may take, we may not get the victory with the first or second or third temptation, but if we stay in trust, we eventually get the victories. But that isn't ultimately what determines it. What determines it is the trust of our individual self to Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 33 through 37, Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For out of the overflow of the, mouth, uh, overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good man brings forth good out of the good stored up in him. The evil man brings forth the evil of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment. For every careless word they have spoken... For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. What did Jesus just say the words are evidence of? The heart, the character. It's ultimately who you've chosen to become. Are you a wheat or are you a weed? Are you a sheep or are you a goat? Have you surrendered to Christ and been reborn to love God and others? Or have you hardened yourself in fear and selfishness? That's ultimately what the judgment is at the end. So the end of the thousand years, the New Jerusalem's on earth, 
and the gates of the New Jerusalem are open, and the wicked are raised, and they set about making implements of war, and during this period of time, no one comes in. Their actions reveal what they prefer, and then they experience God's unveiled self, infinite truth and love flow out over the earth, and they all acknowledge that they were wrong and Christ is right. And they all fall on a knee and acknowledge that, but the compelling weight of evidence and truth, they can't deny it any longer. But then they get up after their acknowledgement and they still march on the city to try and destroy it, again showing that truth has no impact on them. There's no conversion. There's no transformation. Or there's no love for God and others. There's only a desire to conquer and destroy. Selfishness. I, you can see this in the world around us right now, folks. You saw this in the trial of Christ when after the divinity flashed through humanity and he attaches an ear onto a man that they still arrested him and crucified him. Evidence doesn't have an impact on those who've destroyed the faculties that love and are sensitive to truth. And then all the saved in the city are watching this evidence and are making a final judgment about God that there was nothing more he could have done that all were lost by their own free will choice. No human law courts in any of the judgments, folks. That's a lie of the Roman penal legal infection of Christianity. And anybody who's teaching penal substitution theology with a human law court is teaching the infection that we are to remove ourselves from to come back into a true trust relationship from God. It's an obstacle to the final message of mercy. And then the wrath of God, Paul describes in verse 24, 26, and 28 what it is. Therefore God gave them up. Therefore God let them go. And what happens when God finally gives them what they freely chose? When the life giver lets go, what happens? What happens if a parent is holding the hand of a rebellious child who has jumped off the edge of a tall building and the child is screaming and fighting and kicking and every time the parent pulls the child back onto the roof, the child jumps again and again and again and again. And what happens if after infinite amount of attempts, the parent finally lets the child go and have their free will, rebellious way, what happens to the child? The child dies. Why does the child die? Does the child die because the parent is angry and, and upset and, and uses power to kill them? No. Because they're out of harmony with the law upon which life operates upon. That's right. And that's called in the Bible God's wrath. God letting go.